Welcome to OceanWise. I'm Dr. Chris Lowe. I'm a professor of marine biology and the director of the Shark Lab at Cal State Long Beach. OceanWise is a program dedicated to studying and uh, talking about ocean-related issues, hopefully making the public more aware of many of the things that occur in our marine environment. So today, we're going to talk about beach safety. And I'm very fortunate to have Lieutenant Claude Panis here from the Huntington Beach Lifeguards. Claude and I have worked together a number of times many on years. a variety <laughs> of issues. And today, we're going to talk about various aspects of beach safety. So um, obviously, people go to the ocean to recreate. Um, many of them may come from kind of remote places, places centralized in the country. They're used to being in pools and ponds. And, and I think a lot of times, people don't understand that the ocean's a wild place. Yeah, we get a lot of visitors from all over, out of state, out of the country, and uh, Huntington Beach has become a kind of a destination now. So a lot of the people there aren't really familiar with the, the ocean or uh, beaches in general. Uh, a, lot, a lot of what people think when they come to the beach is that it's a big swimming pool. And we really try to discourage uh, people from thinking that by educating them. They need to understand that the ocean's a very dynamic environment. It's not like a swimming pool. There's not a shallow end and there's not a deep end. There are currents, there are waves. There's a lot going on in the ocean that if you're not aware of could actually get you into a lot of trouble. So most of the time people think when they go to the ocean, the biggest thing they have to worry about are the animals that live there, right? And obviously we share beaches with a lot of marine life that also call that their home. But it's really not necessarily the animals are the things that people have to be most concerned about when they go to the beach. So what are the biggest challenges that you face as a lifeguard for people when they come to your beaches? Yeah, first off, when people come to the beach, they need to realize that they're entering a wilderness area. It's just the same as if you went to the mountains and went into a forest, you might see a bear. Well, you may see some wildlife there. In fact, you're probably going to see wildlife there because it's teeming with wildlife. Uh, we always recommend that you give the wildlife its distance, just like you would in the mountains, and stay away. If you see something uh, like a shark or whatever, report it to the lifeguards, let them know. But what people really need to uh, worry about is not so much the wildlife in there, but they need to worry about what's going on in the water as far as the currents and everything. Uh, over 90% of our rescues are caused by a condition called a rip current. And uh, as far as the sharks and the sea lions and everything in there, they are a small part of what you have to worry about when you come to the beach. Rip current should really be high on the list. So if we could have figure one. So a rip current, just so people know, a rip current is caused by waves pounding on the shore. And of course, you get these sandbars that are formed a little bit offshore, and it causes the water to channel and then rush offshore. So That's that correct. channel is what's called the rip current. And water can move through there at six miles an hour. Yes. So an Olympic swimmer can only swim how fast? Oh, I don't know. They did, didn't they have Phelps race a shark once or something? He only do four miles an hour. <laughs> Bottom line is you're not going to swim against the current. I don't care how hard you try, even with fins on, you're not going to make it out. So. And, and that's a big mistake, right? That's yes. the biggest mistake people try to make, is they try swimming against a rip current. And then what right. happens? Well, what happens is they get, eventually get tired. You know, you, what you have is you have these waves washing up on the beach, and then the water is trying to seek its own level, so you have gravity pulling it out. And it's going to find the path of least resistance, which turns into a rip current. It's like a, a river of water. It's like if you jumped into a, a river in the mountains and tried to swim upstream against the river, you're not going to go very far. The only thing you're going to do is tire yourself out, which is going to make the situation even worse. So people need to be aware of where the rip currents are, how they spot them, and uh, what to do if they get into a rip current. So if we can have figure two, so what should people do if they find themselves in a rip current? What's the easiest way to get out of a rip current? Yeah. First and foremost, Try to avoid getting into the rip current. Exactly. And what we tell people, and I say it to them blue in the face, is swim near an open lifeguard tower and check with the lifeguard. The lifeguard gets on scene, and the first thing he does is he picks out those trouble spots where the rip currents are, and then he's going to give you that information. So the, the first key to being safe is not going into the trouble area, and that's all about being educated by a lifeguard. Secondly, uh, it's a dynamic environment. We have what's also called a lateral current. So you may enter the water where there is no rip current, but the lateral current will pull you into the area where the rip current is, and at that point, you're going to be going out to sea. If you do notice that you're drifting out from shore and you're a little further out than you really thought you were, the first thing you do is don't panic. Relax, and if the lifeguard's watching, they're probably going to contact you before you get too far out or you know, remove you before you get in the rip current. But if you want to put your hand up, wave the lifeguard, let him know, hey, I need assistance, that's it. But the bottom line is to stay calm. If you have swimming ability, which we highly recommend, everybody learn to swim. Absolutely. You know, I had my kids in swim lessons at a very young age. But if you do know how to swim, look at the shore, swim parallel to shore. In other words, you're not going to swim up against the current. You're going to swim sideways out of the current. Once you're out of the current, now you can take a direct path to shore, and you're going to have a lot better chance of making it back into shore. 
So about how many rescues do you perform a year just at Huntington Beach? Yeah, we're probably just shy of 10,000 rescues on, on a year. So, you know, we go out quite a bit. We get a lot of people because our beach has a lot of parking. And we also are a southwest facing beach. So right. we've got the south swell coming in in the summertime, west swell coming in in the wintertime. And it just, it's, it's surf city for a reason. It's because right. we constantly have surf. And anytime you have surf, you're going to have currents and you're going to have rip currents. So it really is a formula for a lot of activity on our beach. So aside from ocean conditions, obviously there are animals that people will interact with when they go to the beach. And probably the most common ones in Southern California that can cause injury to people are stingrays. So um, if we can have the next figure. So there are about three different species of stingrays found on Southern California beaches. So there are bat rays, there are butterfly rays, and there are the round stingray. So the round stingray accounts for the bulk of most of the stingrays we find here. And their behavior for avoiding predators is to bury themselves in the sand and hold their breath as something goes by. Well, of course, as people are tromping around there and they accidentally step on the ray, the ray will defend itself by flicking up its tail and sticking them. So people say that I get stung by a stingray. But what they've actually been is their leg has been perforated by a modified spine that has a toxin on it. And it is extremely painful. So how common do you have stingray related injuries at Huntington Beach? I gotta say the last four years, it has dramatically increased and we don't really understand the reasons why. You probably know more about that than I do, but Stingray will give you a bad day. It'll make your day really bad at the beach because that toxin you talked about is very painful. Oh, yeah. And I've personally seen grown men in tears from, from it. So uh, that's something that people really need to be concerned about. And yeah, they do lay in the sand, they do hide, and the poor animal's been stepped on. Somebody stepped on its head and it's going in the defensive mode, so it's doing what it can, stings them. You know, usually it's in the foot, it's uh, ankle sometimes. We've had fishermen get stung on the pier, but most of our injuries come from people going out in the water. Again, check in with the lifeguard at the tower. You know, swim near the lifeguard tower, check in with him. He's gonna warn you if uh, the stingray action is up. And it's driven by several conditions. We can almost predict when we're gonna have stingrays, but he's gonna tell you, know, tell you where to go or tell you what to do. Uh, one of the, the biggest things we tell people is to do the stingray shuffle. Shuffle right. your feet on the bottom as you're going out so you don't step on top of the stingray. You're kind of warning it that you're showing up and the stingray doesn't want to sting you. He's gonna swim away and go somewhere else. So that's one of the biggest things that we tell people. Great. So if we can have the next figure, there are conditions that are kind of stingray conditions, right? So we've learned from our tracking behavior that stingrays like to creep in closer to the shoreline when the swell goes down. And of course, when it's low tide and, and it's really warm, those rays are in trying to feed in areas that they normally couldn't feed because they don't like to be right in the surf. So you must see a big spike in injuries during those conditions. So what do you tell the public when you experience, when we know those conditions are coming? Yeah, well, when we have the, the typically it's driven by the low tide. And what I think it is, is that you have people going in the water and the conditions being down bring the stingrays in, but it also looks less intimidating to the average person that's right. gonna go out and swim. You know, you get to the beach and you see big four to six foot waves. Some people at Voice is gonna tell them, I don't wanna go out in the water today, but when it's calm, and it looks more like a swimming pool, people are more apt to go out and go in the water. The biggest factor we have in dealing with this is a low tide, uh, usually a zero or less, a negative low tide, uh, for a couple reasons. I think it enables people to go out further where the stingrays are, and it just, it, it brings the stingrays. I think the stingrays are just more accessible by people when they walk out. So we try to warn people, uh, if at all possible, don't come down to the beach during a, a negative low tide. Uh, zero zero or anything less than that, it's probably going to be trouble. And we can predict it like clockwork. If we see a low tide coming, we know we need to get the hot water ready and everything else. But uh, more than that, we're going to tell people to, again, do the stingray shuffle. Enter the water cautiously, shuffle your feet on the bottom, and if you can avoid having your feet on the bottom, you're going to do a lot better. I got uh, stung when I was 15, and I remember the pain from that, and I don't ever want to <laughs> yeah. feel that pain again. Exactly. And uh, for that reason, I mean, whenever I can, I keep my feet off the bottom, and I haven't been stung, and I'm, you know, pushing 58, and <laughs> still haven't been stung yet. I'll probably go out and get stung next week. But, That's uh, how it goes, by the yeah, way. Yeah, you just got to be careful. Minimize contact with the bottom and do the stingray shuffle. So what should somebody do if they're stung by a stingray? Let's say they're at a public beach, and they know they've been stung, because they'll recognize the pain. Oh, yeah. What do they do? Yeah, the first thing is uh, go to the lifeguards. Go to the tower. Uh, if you see a lifeguard truck driving by, flag him down. We will treat the symptoms, uh, and, and the, the biggest symptom is, of course, is that pain. Uh, the first thing we do is we've got bags that we use, and we put hot water in it. Not hot enough to scald you, but hot enough 
to uh, neutralize the poison and the sting. All the marine toxins really work in cold water, but when you take them and put them in hot water, it starts breaking down the proteins and the poison and people get relief. It's not gonna be immediate. You may have to soak your foot in the hot water for half hour, 45 minutes, and some people even up to an hour, but that's gonna be the treatment. And you can only really get the hot water if you contact the lifeguard on the beach to get it to you. And secondly, we recommend anybody that gets stung because you've basically received a puncture wound. And of the five different injuries, a puncture wound is the most apt to get infected. So we always recommend that people go to the emergency room, go see your doctor, have it checked out. They may put you on antibiotics, but follow up because the sting is one thing. If you get an infection in there, you're gonna be dealing with a whole other problem. Right, and, that, and that's a really common thing, especially in Southern California. So Southern California actually has probably some of the most high stingray related injuries anywhere in the country. So people have to remember, you come to Southern California beach, you really have to do the stingray shuffle just to be careful. But those aren't the only animals that sting in the ocean. We also have jellyfish, which is the common name that most people use. We call them sea jellies. Mm -hmm. And these are animals that are gelatinous animals. They have long tentacles. And in those tentacles, they have stinging cells, which they use to catch food and defend themselves. Now, in Southern California, we don't have a lot of sea jellies along our shore. We have things like hydroids that will attach to algae. And it's pretty easy people to know when they've been stung by something because they won't see a wound, like a stingray wound, but the skin will burn and it will start to welt. So how frequently do people experience sea jelly stings in Southern California? You know, we, that kind of comes and goes in waves too. There was uh, several years back where our water was loaded with them. They were the purple ones. They were everywhere. It was the point where if you went in the water, you were gonna get stung by the jellyfish. Now, if I had to choose between getting stung by a stingray or getting stung by a jellyfish, I, 10 times out of 10, I'm gonna take the jellyfish sting because the jellyfish sting is, it's, it's not a puncture wound. It's more like you said, it's a rash on the skin. People may notice a skin irritation at first and then it starts hurting worse, but the best thing about those is we can come up with a mixture of vinegar and water, spray it on the wound, and most people get immediate relief. So the you know, lifeguard's a big hero. He comes up, squirts him with it and everything, and all of a sudden, I'm cured, I'm well, and we immediately take care of the pain, and, and usually there's no repercussions from that. In fact, unless you're really having a severe skin reaction, we don't even really recommend following up with a doctor. But uh, yeah, the, 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 stingray, or the, the jellyfish on the beach are definitely a problem that comes in waves. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's a cyclical thing. And in other places, it's, it's really common, especially along the East Coast and, and in the summer. So if we can have the next figure, if somebody gets stung by a sea jelly, the thing we recommend is the first thing you have to do is remove the tentacles. Because if you try scraping those, you'll actually cause all the nematocysts, the stinging cells, to continue to fire. So you either want to use a pair of tweezers or your fingers to gently peel that away. And then as you were mentioning, you have that squirt bottle with the magic solution, right? So it's usually vinegar and water. Other people have tried soap and water. Some tenderizer. people say you're supposed to pee on it. Most of those things don't work nearly I'll take as the vinegar. well. vinegar. Exactly, exactly. And of course, that helps relieve the pain. And then after that, you can use a hot compress, which also helps relieve that pain. Because right. as you pointed out, many marine venoms are temperature sensitive. And mm -hmm. if you hit them with a high enough temperature, it breaks that down. Correct. So um, many other places, obviously, people have to be concerned about that. But here in the U.S., we also have an issue where shark populations are going up. So as our shark populations are going up, and a lot of that's because we've done a better job at managing our fisheries, we've done a better job at basically protecting certain species, and a great example of that are white sharks. And in Southern California, they use our beaches as a nursery habitat. So it's kind of remarkable. This is one of the few places in the world where you can go and be at a public beach and actually see a juvenile white shark. That isn't always something that people cheer about. Right? So the idea of having all these young white sharks along a public beach can cause a lot of public concern. So we've spent a lot of time the last 10 years trying to learn about those, but what do lifeguards do when you have a shark sighting at a public beach? Well, it seems like in 2016 we really started having a, a problem with, well, I don't want to call it a problem, it was more sightings, increase in sightings, a dramatic increase in sightings, and uh, they were definitely the white sharks that you talk about, the juveniles that are staying close and everything. As lifeguards, you know, we're, we're concerned about what's going on in the water too, and I reiterate again, it's, it's a wildlife area, you're gonna see wildlife, so they, that's just naturally where they go. People come to the beach, sharks come to the beach, they can coexist. These uh, juvenile white sharks, which you call JD, JWS, I guess is your right. an acronym, which I yeah. might wanna rethink that, it sounds like a movie I saw back in the 70s, but <laughs> that movie actually is what scares a lot of people. For the most part, if you do see a shark there, it's not abnormal. Just understand that. But with that said, uh, we like to have 
you know, information on sightings. And if you do see a shark, uh, just look at it, see how far it is offshore uh, while you're watching it. If you can see the shark, you know, at all up close without getting too close to it, we recommend you keep your distance. But, you know, approximately how big is it? Or how big was the fin that you saw? Was it swimming south? Was it swimming north? We want to know that information. And um, in general, with the color, if you can see the color or anything else. But as much information as you can, flag down the nearest lifeguard. Let him know when you saw it. Let him know approximately where you saw it. And we take that information and based on what the shark's behavior is, what the size is and everything else, we've got uh, different responses, a uh, different level of responses that we will do. You know, maybe from posting signs and if there was, which is really rare, if there was any kind of what we consider ag aggressive activity, we may even close the water down, but that's a rare, rare one for us. But uh, as much information as we can get from people that see him, uh, the better. And do it in a timely manner. Uh, I got a call once, it was the next day, they'd spotted one out of the cliffs, and it doesn't really help us too much no. if we're getting the information late. So as soon as you can, report it to the lifeguards. So if we can have figure five, so this is a, a photograph of a juvenile white shark off the beach. And what a lot of people don't realize is that quite often these sharks will come in fairly close to the shore and, and usually right outside the surf break, and sometimes they're even in the surf themselves. And they're there, we think, to avoid predators. Believe it or not, those young white sharks are born, their moms give birth to them, they're completely on their own, and they don't know what a predator is. So we think the reason why they come in close to the beaches is that's a safe place for them. The other thing is they have to learn how to feed on their own. And the thing that we find most commonly in baby white shark stomachs are stingrays. And as we just talked about, there are a lot of stingrays off our public beaches. So those sharks are actually there keeping people safer by reducing the stingray population. So I, I tell the lifeguards that all the time. You know, actually the sharks are our friends. They're taking care of a problem that we have because, you know, if you have to look at sharks versus stingrays, stingrays are a way, way bigger problem than, than a, a shark sighting every now and then. And of course, the other thing is they like the warm water, which is the same reason people are at the beach. Right. Now, the other thing that we commonly see, if we can have figure six, a lot of times we'll get these aggregations of sharks right up along the shoreline. And the public will see 30 or 40 of them and they'll completely panic. They'll think, oh, those are all white sharks. And it turns out they're leopard sharks. Very, very common. Adult females come into our beaches to warm up. They use that as, as kind of a gestating habitat so they can speed up their pregnancies. So people need to look for those important markings, right? And the, just like you were saying, the size tells us something, the color patterns, and how they're behaving. So be able to relay that information accurately to lifeguards helps lifeguards better advise the public. So what people do if they encounter shark? Yeah, if, if you're in the water and you encounter a shark, just like any other wildlife, you want to give it distance. Don't swim up to it. You know, we had people for a while who were swimming up with GoPros and trying to actually take pictures of sharks. It's a wild animal, you know. It's, Juvenile white shark really is, is not looking for people to eat, but by the same token, it is a wild animal, and if it feels threatened, it may react differently. So uh, enjoy it from a distance. If you, don't, if you don't feel safe, just leave the water, and we recommend you, you leave the water anyways. Track down a lifeguard and let us know that the shark's out there so that right. we can keep an eye on it and make a decision on what we need to do. But for the most part, you just need to observe from a distance, and you know, safety is a factor. You, you wouldn't go up to a bear in the forest and, and look at it. You probably calmly walk the other way. So you just need to treat wildlife with respect and give it their distance. So if we can have the next figure. So one of the things we always like to tell the public is, look, if you see a shark, that's kind of a cool experience, right? There's no evidence that these young sharks pose a threat to people. But what you should always do is keep your eyes on the animal. It's a predator, and even as a juvenile, its job is to kind of sneak up on things. It, it knows if it's been sighted that the gig is up. So we always tell people, look, keep your eyes on the shark, track the shark, the shark knows it's being watched. So a lot of people say, well, I'm on my surfboard and I'm not looking underwater, how do I know where it is? So, well, if you see the fin, we always tell people to orient your board in the direction of the shark, track the shark. And by doing that, the shark knows it's being watched. So these are some really basic things that people can do, as well as stay in a group, right? So if you're out surfing, surf in front of a guard shack. Uh, you're swimming, swim in a group. There's always safety in numbers. Even though these young sharks really don't pose a threat to people, it's better to be safe and just stay in a group. And that's one of the things we always recommend. Don't ever swim alone. Get a buddy with you. Go out in a group. Have people around. If you get in trouble, there's going to be somebody there that can go get you help. So, yeah, for that reason, don't swim alone. And, yeah, you're giving me a lot of good information. Uh, you know, we see sharks all the time and, you know, just pointing at them and letting the shark know that you know he's there and probably going to move on. You know, they're, they're young animals. It looks like they're curious. They may they swim up to, uh, we've had surfers in the water see them swim towards them. As soon as they realize it's human, they're gone, never to be seen again. So I think it's just a curiosity factor with these young juvenile white sharks. They're swimming up and just, you know, they're curious. It's, it's a baby. Right. Things new to the world, everything's new. And I think that they're checking out and 
trying to be safe by being in the surf, but they're also going to be around people and they're going to be a little curious, but they're in no ways are they going to be hunting people down. So one of the other challenges we have with sharks and marine mammal populations coming back, which are really conservation success stories, is that as those numbers recover, more of these animals that get sick start showing up on public beaches. And that's rare. So normally we don't see sick animals kind of, kind of coming up on a beach. So it's called stranding. Mm -hmm. So sick sharks will do that, sick marine mammals will do that, and they will actually wash up on the shoreline. And the public obviously feels sympathetic for them and they want to rescue them and push them back out to sea. But we don't recommend that because that's simply not safe. That's a wild animal, it's usually sick. So lifeguards are usually the first on scene. What do you do when, when you encounter something like that? We usually get flagged down by people and it, it may be a shark, more likely not, it's usually sea lions. And you know, you get these young pups that come up and they're cute and they're cuddly. People want to coddle them and keep them warm or get them back in the water or whatever but they're a wild animal. They will bite you. If you're not careful and you go up, they will bite you. If you see a, an animal that's on the beach, number one, be aware, like they don't really want to be around people. So if they're up there, there's something wrong. The shark, uh, the shark or the sea lion would not put itself in an area where it could be approached by humans. So you need, you need to use caution. You have a sick animal, it's probably distressed. The animal is potentially dangerous because it's sick and it's uh, protecting itself, but it's obviously too weak to be in the water give it distance. Again, it's wildlife. Respect it, give it distance, flag down a lifeguard. Go to the lifeguard tower, report that there's an animal down there. We typically will respond out with signs if it's a marine mammal, a sea, a sea lion or a sea lion pup. We'll put signs out warning people that you know it's there and stay away, give its distance. We work closely with uh, rescue groups, Pacific Marine Mammal Rescue down at Laguna Beach. What we'll do is we'll call them and then uh, if they're not too busy, they make a decision on whether this is uh, a case where they want to come down and actually remove it or they may tell us to put the signs around, let it rest and hopefully it'll return to the water. But do not try to push the shark back out in the water. Do not try to put the sea lion out in the water. Do not pour water on the sea lion's head. Do not pet the sea lion. Give it some distance, enjoy it from afar, report it to a lifeguard, and we'll take it from there. So if we can have figure nine, so this is typically what people experience. They go to the beach, you'll see a shark on the beach or a sea lion on the beach. And one of the things we also see people doing is taking selfies with these animals. And, and a lot of times they don't remember that these are wild animals. So as you're pointing out, obviously you want to keep your distance from these things and you want to report it. So they should report it to lifeguards. And if no lifeguards are on duty, you can report it to the stranding centers. So the numbers are available. People can access them online. Please report these because we don't want anybody getting hurt by these injured marine life. And if you're in an area where you know there are no open lifeguard towers, we actually have signs posted on the towers now with those numbers, contact numbers for Pacific Marine Mammal. So you can you can get in touch with people, which is great, which is great. So it, obviously we covered a lot of topics in this, and there are a lot of things that people need to be aware of before they go to a beach. So they should always do their homework. But we also have some resources that we make available. So if we can have the next figure, we have shark shacks that that we've designed to deal with public safety issues and we work very closely with all the lifeguards in Southern California and you can encounter a shark shack anywhere along the Southern California coast. They're all online. You can check them out online at the Shark Lab uh, website. And we also have a comic book for kids called Beach Days, which we're mm -hmm. giving out to kids at local beaches. And the idea here is to educate kids about beach safety in a fun comic book way. So um, student kids that are part of junior lifeguards all get a copy and we're in the project of uh, process of producing another copy which next year will be on marine pollution, which is another issue. It's a public safety issue as well as a serious issue for our, for our oceans. So if we can have that figure of the comic book so people can get this uh, information online, they can also access this uh, on our website and any probably lifeguard station probably will have those. So we want to uh, thank you for your time. And we know that California lifeguards spend, are, they're probably some of the best trained lifeguards in, in the world. Um, this is one of the few places where we actually have professional lifeguards that are on duty year round. And California, Southern California in particular, is one of the few places where lifeguards work all year round. So obviously summertime is your busiest time. And right now you're facing some challenges of, you know, kids going back <laughs> to school, you're losing some of your guards because they're going back to school. So people really should pay attention to the season too, right? Please, swim near an open lifeguard tower. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the best thing you do. Always check with the lifeguards. Um, 
And, and for the kids and everything too, you know, your safety starts before you even get to the beach. We really tell kids, make sure you drink a lot of water, make sure you eat a good breakfast, make sure you put that sunscreen on before you even head out the door, reapply it every day or, or every hour when you're down there if it comes off and you're in the water. But the main thing is safety starts at home, then when you get to the beach, check in with the lifeguard. And we're, we're not resp totally responsible for your safety. You have to make sure you swim near an open lifeguard tower and everything, but we're there to make sure that you have a safe day. So swimming near an open lifeguard tower and, and checking in with the lifeguard is always a good thing to do when you come down to the beach. And obviously the ocean is a wild place <clears throat> and people are really responsible for their own safety. So while you're there to get them out of trouble, if they get into trouble, it's not your job to protect them. It's really yeah. their job to make sure they've done their homework and they know what they're going to encounter when they go to any public beach. Yeah. Well, it is our job to protect them when they're there, but it's their responsibility to make sure that they are Correct. in an area where we can't protect them. Uh, you know, people will go to beaches where there's no lifeguards yeah. on duty and no staff available, and you know, you're, you're kind of asking for trouble. So, uh, like I said, look for that open lifeguard tower, swim to the tower, and check with the lifeguard. I, I can't give you any more concrete advice than that. And uh, we're there for your safety. We're going to make sure that you have a safe day. Our guards are well trained. They're uh, they're excellent lifeguards. They deal with uh, preventative action, rescue calls routinely on a daily basis and uh, we're, we're going to make sure that you have a good day at the beach. So a lot of the information that we've talked about today are available on many of the lifeguards websites. They have all this information that we've covered. In addition, the Shark Lab has all this information on our website. So really there's plenty of resources that the public can use to find out. But they're going to a beach for the first time, they can walk down, they can ask any lifeguard this information, right? Right. You get online before you get down and you know, we typically, we, uh, we do public education for schools that come and we do beach safety lectures and everything, but uh, ultimately the lifeguard's going to give you the current information for the specific to the area that you're swimming. Uh, and that's going to be the most valuable information when you come down to the beach, what's happening, because uh, it's all driven by the tides, it's driven yeah. by the surf, and it changes like the weather. So, you know, checking in with that lifeguard is just paramount to a, a safe day on the beach. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and I really appreciate your knowledge and experience and years of doing this. And well, I want to thank you for your expertise and all the stuff you're doing to educate people. It's, uh, it's helped us out as lifeguards quite a bit. So on behalf of the lifeguards, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing for us. Well, thank you. That's much appreciated. <laughs> so thank you for joining us on Ocean Wise. Uh, we look forward to having you on our next upcoming episodes. And be safe when you're at the beach. Thank you.